I'm going to be presenting a, a topic that's very close to my heart, but unfortunately, because we, we have a limited amount of time, I'm going to cut my heart out of this for the time being. And I'll give you the overview of um, the overview of the story. And then I'd like to present you with a very specific question. Um, and so the place that I'd like to start was around last year, November. So around last year, November, I gave a TEDx talk around the topic of self-directed learning. So I'll give you the, the 30 second backstory about me and how it came to this point, um, place and time. So I've always been a somewhat uh, difficult student. I struggled all the way through my, my, my education um, right up until you know university or college years. And I, it would turn out that I'd eventually drop out. But right before I did, I spent about a month job shadowing at one of the banks and I got to see what uh, designers actually do. And, and I got to see like all of the hours that I'd spent playing computer games and kind of doing all of these other things. Finally, I'd kind of like seen something that I could do and I could apply those skills to. And suddenly what was such a, you know, such a difficult challenge eventually evolved into something that, that I've dedicated my life to. And so the, the, the main problem that I presented um, at TEDx, which I'll, I'll, I'll sort of skip through right until where I left the conversation in that, uh, in that talk. And the question that I put forward is, you know, in a world where technology is advancing at such a crazy rate with artificial intelligence, neural networks, satellite, uh, low orbiting satellites, all of these things are kind of pushing the frontier of technology so quickly. There's one question that we have yet to ask. What is the most effective way to pass our knowledge on from one generation to the next? You know, in every conversation we have, there's always, um, you know, a bit of a, a cynical perspective about the education system and, the and its future. But we never really nail down an answer of what that might look like. And so I presented the first two foundations of what education might look like as technology and our capabilities develop. Now, every single learning system, regardless of whether it's the onboarding process for a website, the introduction to a game, or um, the schooling of a child has three essential foundations. There's a method of learning. This is also called the pedagogy. This is the way that the, the learner actually engages with the material and with the educator, and which leads you to the educator, which is a person who, if not as more experienced, can create an environment specifically ideal for learning. And the last is the learning material, which is the, the, the actual knowledge that you're absorbing. And so in this talk, I, uh, I kind of took each one and overlaid my experience and the challenges I faced as a, as a student um, that, that got in the way of my progress. And the main thing was um, I would find out along my, my education process that I was dyslexic. And so the chat, because the, um, the amount of reading required in the education process only starts to lead more and more into, into reading, the cycle couldn't really function properly for me. And so I, I looked at three questions, one for each of those areas of what education might look like if we take, take on some of the, the, the current um, knowledge and some of the technology that's available to us to further each of these three areas. And so for the first one, I looked at a, an idea presented by Lev Vygotsky called the Zone of Proximal Development. And it's a way of mapping a person's learning. And I'll just briefly, briefly uh, touch over it because we'll, we'll explore it in a little bit more detail further down the line. But it essentially speaks about three zones, the zone of mastered knowledge, the things that you know how to do, the things that don't really need you to, to use much of your processing power. And then there's this much larger domain of the things that, that you can't do even with help, the things that are outside of your capability and where learning typically focuses in the, uh, in the typical schooling environment. But then Vygotsky speaks about this interesting middle ground, um, this zone of ideal learning. And the last idea that he adds is the idea of the more knowledgeable other, a person more experienced than the learner. And what the more knowledgeable other does is they actually allow for that zone to expand by creating a, a domain of, of 
um, that is safe to explore by their influence. And this is this is a relationship we can see with parents and children, with managers and, and direct reports in all, all sorts of places. And so the way that I, I expand on this is that we can we could probably do a lot for the material that we present in a learning environment if it's focused on the interests and the things that lie within the zone of proximal development, the things that are slightly outside of their capabilities, but with a little bit of effort, they can, they can, um, they can engage with new ideas and grow their, their own body of knowledge. And so I call this focusing on adaptive learning mater material. And the adaptive element is the fact that the content of the learning experience is based on the interests and abilities of the individual, which is what um, one of the points that was, you know, just shared with us. And then the second uh, interesting challenge is needing an agnostic learning method. And my own experience really exemplified this one because, because the only way really for me to engage with the knowledge was through reading. For the majority of my, my, my schooling career, all of that knowledge was out of access. Once I left that environment and I was able to decide for myself how and what I learn, I started to dive into audiobooks and I pretty much educated myself through my ears. And, you know, it's, it's somewhat ironic because even though, you know, we, we think about how much technology has, has evolved, speech has been the underlying means of, of transferring knowledge in, for humanity all the way through history, like the printing press is really just a blip in the, in the span of that time. And so for a long time, oral tradition was the main form of education. And I e essentially took that through my own initiative and following my own interests to build that for myself. And so the next, the next thing that I look at is how, how could we actually do that? How could we actually systemize this idea that allows a person to learn in a way that they are most comfortable with and capable of? And so I looked at three sort of developmental relationships and, and how each of them um, explore a different kind of learning. That of the, the, the parent-child relationship. And this is specifically important because the way a baby learns is quite different from the way you learn at school and the way you, you eventually learn as a professional. Because a baby almost learns by just being in the world. There's just sensory stimulation and that stimulation is giving them more, more data with which to reference from. And that's how they eventually build things like their first speech. And a very interesting idea um, around that topic is parents actually instinctively know how to, how to teach a baby to talk. And the way that they do that is using um, speech and vocabulary that is just above their level. So they'll use, for example, baby talk for, a ba for um, an, an infant that's at, at that level, but using words that are outside of their vocabulary um, just by a little bit. And slowly the child starts to build their vocabulary. And the funny thing is before they, a child has learned any of um, um, of the of the sounds that are necessary for the language, they make all of the possible sounds that you could make to 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 speak a language. But then, as they develop and as they they learn the specific ones from their parents, they lose the ability to want to to use the ones that aren't um, within the language that they're learning. And so, the interesting thing about this first type of learning relationship is that it focuses on on being in the world as the foundation of the learning experience. And then, you know, um, if we fast forward into, into the future and the development of, of, of um, knowledge and crafts, we look at the relationship between an apprentice and a, and a crafts master. Before the Industrial Revolution, you have this, these set of skilled individuals who have um, turned a skill into something repeatable and something that provides value to the community. And they would take on this apprentice. And this person would learn by actually following in the footsteps of the craft master. And they would learn by actually doing. And the interesting thing is that the typical apprenticeship would run, start at around the age of 13. And the apprentice would join the household of the craft master. And he would learn both how to work in the business, but he would also learn what the lifestyle of this person looks like. And so this was an approach to learning that focuses on learning by doing, or learning by actually embodying this specific role that the craft master plays. And then if we look into the Industrial Revolution, when guilds and apprenticeships started to, to dissolve, the need for learning changed. Because now we needed a form of learning 
that could take a non-skilled worker, make them semi-skilled so that they can use a machine to create um, resources that previously required skilled labor. And so the need for apprenticeship sort of dissolved into society. And I mean, one of the, the, the hallmarks, at least here in South Africa, where I'm, 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 I'm living, is a lot of the technicons got uh, dissolved um, or turned into, you know, either shut down or turned into universities uh, very soon after South Africa's democracy. And so what that meant is you had this band of, of very, very hands-on skills that previously required apprenticeships that currently don't have a, a, a clear learning path. And there are so many um, skill sets and crafts that are eventually re-emerging after the Industrial Revolution because the idea of craft specialists is re-emerging. The idea of a UX designer as a specialist is back in, and we cannot simply rely on a, on a, you know, a waterfall sort of function, functional production line to create the things that we need to create. And so one of the interesting things that I found um, when looking at these three forms of, of, of learning is that the only one that we don't have, the only one that isn't officially standardized is the idea of learning through practice. We've, we still have our, our parental relationships and those are evolving to, to the modern time. And we still have these, these sort of schools that do sort of mass education. But there isn't really a foundation or a, a sense of... of um, structure if a person were to simply decide that they didn't want to be ed educated at school and simply wanted to pick up a craft that they could provide for their community. And so that looks at the adaptive learning method. And the reason why it's adaptive is because you can simply look for a person that practices in the craft that you're interested in to see if that is a place that you can expand on. And the place where I ended this journey last time was on the idea of the educator, because this is probably the hardest one to resolve because any entrepreneur who's tried to scale any kind of service that requires human engagement will know that it is always the hardest part to scale. And so at the moment, my research is in this domain. How can we actually make education, but specifically the educators openly accessible to everybody? And there, um, along the way in my research, there are uh, a couple of different ways that I've explored and that, I, um, that I'm looking at. Um, and I'm going to start from right to left. The first is the idea of an exchange program. And historically, that would be the, um, a journeyman. A person would go out away from their, their geographical location to another land and find a craftmaster in the same discipline as them and learn from them and bring those techniques and knowledge back to their, their domain. And this is a concept that actually exists in businesses today. There are many businesses that do exchange programs, but they do them internally. So you'll maybe go to another location or another branch and learn from that branch and then eventually come back. And so this is one of the ones that we're exploring. And the next is the idea of the apprenticeship. And this one is pretty typical and people um, generally know at least roughly what that might, might look like from a learnership to an internship and so on. And then lastly is that of a multidisciplinary team. And I'd say this is... Oh, sorry, second last. Um, and this is probably the one that is the hottest topic right now. You know, in, in all of our teams, we're, we're, we're stepping a little bit away from the idea of simply having these different design organizations, software engineering organization, product management separately and sort of starting to bring those skills together into individual squads. And so this is another interesting um, dynamic. But the one that I'd like to focus on is peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. And the reason for that is because this is one that if it actually works, it's something that can be available to everybody because it simply requires you to find somebody who's interested in the same thing and they don't necessarily need to know um, more than you. They simply need to have different skills. And so <clears throat> what, what we're, what we're going to explore is how peer-to-peer -peer mentorship is typical from the, the ideal idea of hierarchic mentorship or mentorship with a more a person that's significantly more knowledgeable and a person that's significantly further behind. And what we'll look at is what are the challenges that are actually faced in those types of mentorship relationships? And what opportunities does peer-to-peer -peer mentorship present that doesn't exist where there's an, uh, an, an implied hierarchy? 
So when we think about mentorship right now, you can almost think about it this thing, you know, there's this magical super Yoda who floats in the background and waits to, to see where you've got a challenge and he'll give you advice on all of the important elements of your life and everything will just work out when he arrives in the nick of time. Now, as great as that looks in movies, um, it's not necessarily that simple in real life. And so I started to have, um, around the end of last year, I, I, I connected with a very interesting lady named um, Abby Covert, or she also goes by Abby the AI. And we were talking about the challenges <clears throat> about in hierarchic mentorship and some of the things that actually happened that, that sometimes caused these relationships to not perform as we might expect. And there were three main, main ones that we've been speaking about since. And it's the, this idea of out-of-context mentorship when somebody sort of is trying to give advice or trying to give guidance, but they don't have the context of the challenge at hand. And so their help essentially becomes more um, advice giving rather than actually helping the learning process. And then the imbalance of agency, especially now this, this is one that is only bad when it's prolonged, especially when a person is an intern or very new to an, uh, an environment. Sometimes they do need a lot of a lot of um, guidance and assistance, but the idea should always be, and this is an idea taken from the psychological literature um, and in therapy, is that you should always be working to give them the ability to deal with things themselves. That is always the end goal. Sometimes you need to step in and and help, but the end goal should always be to give them agency. And lastly, every now and then you get a really really good mentor, and he can actually be that Yoda but he can only be Yoda to a couple of people. And so they, they eventually get over leveraged and then perform badly for everybody rather than doing well for the people that are within their capabilities. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. So what I'd like to do is that even, even that very good mentor can actually sometimes be the um, not ideal for learning and how you can actually find that someone closer to where you are can be even more ideal. And it's, it's sort of underpinned by this idea of the four stages of knowledge. And these are the stages you go through when you're learning something new. The first is unconscious incompetence. And this is where you don't even really know what you don't know. It's kind of just like there's this idea of, you know, I think a great example is like NFTs and everybody's heard of them. And, you know, the majority of people actually just think it's, you know, some kind of JPEG online. And it's sort of like, you don't even know how far your ignorance goes. But then as soon as you start to read up about the topic, um, that, that space sort of expands and you start to get to um, understand the things that you need to learn. And then as you learn them, you start to become consciously competent. You actually start to build this body of knowledge that's structured. But then there are those things like, you know, riding a bicycle or breathing or walking that eventually you've been doing them for so long that you don't even think about them. And what can, can tend to happen is a mentor who has got all of these great skills to pass on, who looks like they are the ideal person to help you, can actually not be ideal because they are so far experienced in the thing that they are doing that they don't even know how to, that, that they are unable to lead you through the experience of learning. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of um, parents find that it, it is better for their, their children to be tutored by another student that's further ahead than to, for, for them as the parent to tutor their child. Because a person around their age group, age group has been through the process um, a lot more recently. And so <clears throat> what can happen when they're so far apart is skills that they are capable of doing, they aren't actually capable of mentoring. And they are unable to create this zone of exploration for the learner in their zone of proximal development. And so what it actually... The, the way that I'd like to sort of shift the narrative a little bit is the role of the mentor in the learning of an individual. Now, if we look at these three zones from the zone of proximal development, the high risk area or the things outside of your capability, the areas that are in the ideal learning zone and the things that you know how to do, what we can do is in the zone that is outside of their capability, we create safety, the idea of a psychological safety. This is where it belongs. Psychological safety doesn't mean solving all of their problems for them. But instead, ensuring that things that are too far and that are too risky are protected against. But the things that can help them grow, we focus on allowing them to try and fail because they will eventually fail. And lastly, in this area of mastered knowledge, we can encourage them to become a mentor.
And so we start to build a network. And through this network, we start to grow this, this um, underlying fabric that supports the learning process. And so when you look at a person learning, this is a, sort of a diagram taken from um, Japanese tradition from the island of Okinawa. And it's the concept of the Ikigai. Some of you will be familiar with it. And I'll just kind of hop over it. If, you, if you'd like to get into more detail, I definitely recommend searching it out. But it's a mentorship relationship. You have the idea of the things that the person brings to the table. And those are the things that they are good at and the ways that they serve their community or the things that they get paid to do. And then on the, on the other hand, they have the things that they believe the world needs and the things that they are passionate about. And in the, cen in the center of all four of these quadrants is what, what the, this Japanese tradition believes makes up a life worth living. And this idea is called the Ikigai. And so in this um, peer mentorship experience that, that, we, um, that I've been exploring with Abby, we've been looking at what might it look like if these two people who are on this learning journey come together to create a learning experience that is in both intrinsically motivating and allows them to, 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 ta to tap in the, into that motivation, but also is something that is important and that the world actually needs so that they are providing something that is of value. And so in this experience, you would, you would, go, you would establish this mentorship relationship by bringing these two together. And we'd go through a series of exercises that allow you to actually get to know each other at this level. And together, I'm sorry, and, and you'll see that in where two of these quadrants meet, you'll find an element of your life that can be described by those two meetings. For example, where the world has a need and you love something, that is where your life's mission might be. And the things that you're good at and the things that you love, and those might make your life's passion. And so to find this area of shared learning, what we do is we look at the, <clears throat> the, the areas that they are both passionate about, as well as the things that they are capable of doing. And by that, we can look for areas that, that provide both personal fulfillment but also leverage their strengths. And by doing that, you can start to create a collaborative learning journey that leverages this positive mentorship and using diversity of skill and of, of capability, you can actually allow each other to grow without a, any one of them being more knowledgeable than the other, but simply leverage diversity to create that growth. And so at this point in time where I am in this research project is about building these types of learning journeys from apprenticeships to peer-to-peer -peer mentorship to multidisciplinary multi teams. And one of the things that has really gotten me interested in the idea of focusing on the relationship was one of the greatest stories of mentorship ever. And so in closing, I'd like to do something somewhat different. I'd like you to take a deep breath. And imagine, imagine you're standing in the city center with a sea of faces looking up at you. And they are hanging on your every word. For surely, you're the greatest thinker to have walked the face of the earth. And you have dedicated your entire life's work to the development of the youth of Athens. In your talk, in your word, in your deed. And then one day those that call themselves your enemy. One day they charge you with the most heinous crime. Corrupting the youth of Athens. And they sentence you to death. And as you sit there in the final moments of your life, looking back on what you've done. You remember the hours of discussion with your student, Plato, and all of those dialogues. Not a single one did you write, but every single one would be etched into Western tradition forever. And through this mentorship, through this peer-to-peer -peer engagement, 
the development of hum human education would be forever marked by the work of Socrates and Socratic dialogue. And I believe with these, this idea of shared learning and collaborative mentorship, we can recreate a fabric of education and learning that can prepare us for the present and possibly even for the future. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. That's a very powerful ending. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. Um, I really enjoyed that because I, I really do think that mentorship is incredibly powerful and uh, kind of, I think it's some, an area we can invest more in. And I think mm -hmm. there's a fantastic overlap with Mislav's talk about like identifying mm -hmm. where people are strong and where maybe somebody is weak and then trying to pair them instead of over relying on a manager. Mm. So, exactly. No, that's a that's I, a very good point. I I had one question though because you brought up the kind of the different styles and you mentioned multiplicity multidisciplinary teams as well as kind of apprenticeships and peer to peer. And one thing mm -hmm. that's always bothered me about multidisciplinary teams is that often people can be a bit isolated. Um, and what I mean by that is that you might have one designer on the team and you might have one researcher mm -hmm. on the team. So how do you try to balance that potential isolation of people with a kind of more of an apprenticeship? Where does that fit in? and Where can they learn about their craft in particular? Uh, okay, so so I think that's um, that's two different questions almost, and I'm just gonna stop. Sh uh, at least go out of presenter mode, just so that I can see you. <laughs> um, so I think it's 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 a little bit it's it's you've got two challenges there really because the one challenge is how how do you get this team to grow as like a multidisciplinary team, but then also how do you ensure that the individuals are still building their craft right. And so I think how you, how you do that and the way I think, you know, Spotify have done a, an amazing work in this in this space, but having the idea of um, having guilds and then having actual production teams and the guilds are more focused on the actual craft of what they're doing and the, the production teams are more focused on uh, producing the, the, the um, whatever that the product is. And so what you want to do is ensure that you create learning experiences in both. And this is, I think, the, the place that we usually get wrong is we focus so much on their, their development in their craft skill because that's where they are comfortable that we don't focus that much on ensuring that the team as a whole learns together. And that's one of the most interesting spaces that I, I'm, I'm looking to explore in the future because I think um, the way that you would teach a group like that or the way that they would learn is through case studies because you would need to actually learn by collaborating. You know, with something like like design or software engineering, you can go to the, the specific resources that are about that topic. But there isn't really a lot of material about how does a team come together and learn something. And so I think case studies are a great way to, 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 to bridge that gap. You get some of your, your, your most skilled talent that's most experienced and you document some of the work that they're doing. And you can actually even then start to share that internally with your other team and through exercises and sort of like, you know, um, training, like, uh, you know, uh, what is it called? Uh, mock experiences. You can start to build those same learnings into into your teams. Uh, that's a, a great example. And it ties in nicely with UXCX because we're all about getting product UX design and dev together because if, if you mm -hmm. want to work together... It's one know. of the reasons why I was, I was so keen to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Not very many people are talking about everything together. <laughs> 